Thank you for joining Meet the Masters. Today I'm joined, I'm joined by Grandmaster Bill Strong. Hello, sir. Good, good afternoon. Good afternoon to you as well. I hope all is going well in your part of the world. It's here. It's a finally a beautiful sunny day. Uh, no rain, uh, and we expect up to 70 degree temperatures today. So uh, spring has sprung in Alabama. I wish I could say the same for Delaware. Uh, <laughs> we've had nothing but rain for the past four or five days. So you're going to get more because we pr they predict we'll have it from Sunday through the rest of next week. We've had it for, for so many months, but but the flooding for us is, is is low scale compared to other places in the country. So we're we're pretty lucky. Awesome. I think the last time I saw you uh, at the Region Nine tournament, there was some storms at your your house while you were away. Everything was yes. okay with that. <laughs> yes, they were they were big storms, and I live in deep woods with a very hundred foot tall trees surrounding my house, and uh, I, I just kind of worry about the ground being soft and these 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 hard winds coming through, just blowing them down. And but uh, once again. We were in the donut hole. We didn't. We didn't get the hard, hard stuff. So we're safe once again. Well, again, I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me. I wanted to touch base with you and talk about what's going on with you, and and thank you for your continued support of this project that I've been doing. I, I looked it up. The last time we talked and recorded an interview was was June twenty fifth of twenty twenty. Oh, which is, three years which ago, is almost th three years ago. <laughs> It's hard to believe. Um, this is a big question, but can maybe what have you been up to in those past almost three years? <laughs> <laughs> well, I have I have not been idle during those three years. Uh, you know, the the pandemic did start, and uh, back uh, some you know two or three years ago, I have been very busy. Uh, my my travel. For those two years, virtually stopped, uh, and I did have more travel scheduled and lined up. I, you know, the pandemic starts to hit hard in February, I believe, not not long after Grandmaster Bodwin's passing, and uh, I had to cancel uh, like five trips we already had lined up. Some of them even paid for. We got uh, vouchers, I I think, but um, I was not idle, and. Uh, Importantly for us and our survival, I use this word survival, uh, is that we had Zoom and we then we had individuals like yourself and others like Master Benelli in Ecuador, Master Utah Tech in Alaska, and, and many others who adapted the technologies quite rapidly and started uh, training or, or scheduling training sessions for masters, for black belt, for, for all colors, uh, et cetera. So I participated in all of those. I think probably there were very few that I missed and I taught in many of those as well. Sometimes I didn't stay for the entire time, but I was on there at the beginning of almost everything. So I've been busy with that. Uh, my daughter, Morgan, Master Morgan, who is an ER nurse, uh, a nurse practitioner, she told us at the beginning of the pandemic not to leave the house. <laughs> so, And we live out in the county, but I've stored food here enough. And she would bring us fresh things and put it on the front porch. So we stayed here, but I live in a very beautiful area, and I had no reason to travel and be around a lot of people during those those early years were, were pretty tough. But I also, you know, adapted to being on Zoom like we are now and uh, working with people. We our meetings uh, like the executive committee, the governance committee, the board of directors, uh, our uh, regional directors. We all participated in meeting together on Zoom. That, in a sense, saved us. Uh, it helped our survival. I know we lost membership. Uh, and a few studios during that time, but people around the world uh, flocked together here. And one of the, amongst the many good things that came out of that time period was that we connected widely across the world through this technology. So it was not uncommon for us to have, and I'll mention uh, Master Tabitha Lutz over in Papua New Guinea in the Pacific, 
somewhere north of Australia. On at the same time, we have somebody in the Seychelles, the island off to the eastern side of Africa and, and stretching from way down in uh, Mar del Plata, Argentina to Fairbanks, Alaska. So north and south longitudinally, east and west latitudinally, uh, uh, longitudinal, yeah, longitudinally and latitudinally, I've got it just backwards there. <laughs> we, we connected. And for me, it was kind of midday to three o'clock in the middle of the day. And that would get people in the far west and people in the far east at, at early in the morning or late in the evening. But it kind of brought us together. And I saw people that I don't, I don't really get to see often uh, that are in other countries because it's difficult to travel, right. not just during a pandemic time, but just travel is costly. But I got to see them. They got to know me as well. And I got to know them and, and the people that stepped up to teach, that was just outstanding. Uh, so our instruction continued. The downside, obviously, was that we could not get together and, and practice the technique in that way. So personally, then, I continued my own personal training. Uh, it, was, it was outside. or on, I've got some decks that I can train on. The gym that I train in, uh, just my personal training has a training room, but of course the gyms had to close. As soon as they opened up, <clears throat> I would go there six o'clock in the morning or a little earlier after the first uh, aerobics class and I continued my Kung Do training. I teach Tai Chi Qigong and even before the pandemic, we had started doing some teaching outside, but after the pandemic started and the indoor place where we had, wouldn't allow it any longer, the, uh, the individuals in that class, about 15 or so people said, let's just do it outside. So you've seen the Tennessee River, you've crossed it on the way to the master clinic. There's a big park, uh, some shelters there. So we started and it, it, in the morning, about 8.30, 9 o'clock for an hour or so. And we've, we've done that every, Every year since then, even through the winter, everybody puts on warmer clothes and gloves. We lock it outside and we're only 10 feet away from the, the wide Tennessee River. And it's a beautiful sight. So I kept that, that part, I think, and increased my skills in that. While training alone, you know, that's, that's very different from training with a partner. Yes, I see myself in the mirror. But I, I practice all those things that I could. Empty hand, everything. Uh, you know, the... the uh, the, the bong, the sword, uh, don gum, and it depended on the day what I was going to focus on. Uh, and of course, all the young, which I, I enjoy doing. And I, I did other things that, uh, you know, you know, I have goals every year and would establish some of those. We can talk about that a little bit later if you wish, but yeah. at any rate, I did have some goals in mind. Gotcha. Uh, you mentioned uh, Tabitha, and I, I got the I had the opportunity to uh, proctor her test. So we were in person, and we had her, and I think someone from the Netherlands. Um, so that was interesting to conduct a test in person, and then also have someone following along uh, remotely as well. So that was that was quite interesting. That, that's excellent. And, you know, we promoted her to master here at the master's clinic and uh, Victor Horowitz from, uh, from Holland. We promoted him also uh, with a few other people. So uh, we got together finally and she right. came. Um, it was a very, very happy day for everyone. Well, speaking of getting together in 2021, Region 8 had the opportunity to host the U.S. Nationals, which was our, I guess, our first big group back together is that is that correct i i think it was the very first so. big one yeah i think very very definitely it was and then that followed the next year getting together with a, a master's clinic and a world championship yeah you uh you had the opportunity to promote to, to ninth degree at u.s nationals so first congratulations on that um thank you can you tell us about the experience? I, I, I was very fortunate to be able to be there at the promotion ceremony. 
and it was it was it was intimate, you know, considering all the other Grandmaster promotions have have been at World Championships, and you know we were still limiting the amount of people that were in uh, in groups at that time. So I, I we was were really fortunate to be able to be there. So we were we were still concerned even at the national so we had masking uh, much of the time and uh making sure that we're being as safe as we possibly could be and i think we did a fine job uh, the ceremony uh, was an honorable and grand experience uh, it was as you said rather intimate there were masters who were present for it uh, in that that large room and we had a pretty big stage set up for it. Uh, there were chairs on the sides on the floor for the masters and uh, Master Mamidas and Master Merrill were the principal ones of, of uh, designing it and managing it based on what we had seen in the past and of uh, producing a proclamation. So uh, to to me personally, it was a very honorable experience. Uh, I have been I've been working for years uh, as the eighth don, and at Grandmaster Bodwin's passing, I, I was president of the association, but also now with him passing, I was given the honor of being uh, the Grandmaster, I guess, in waiting. But uh, I play I, I perform that role doubly and continued those two roles in action until January of this year. Uh, so uh, it was conducted there. Everybody was trying to uh, help out in some way. Uh, Gideon set up a video feed. Uh, I had a professional photographer there, to a videographer, and there was a feed, I guess we could see it live. I mean, it was live for me, but other people could see it in remote locations. We, we actually, and I was there doing my part of it, but let them tell me what I should be doing and how to do it. So they set this up so so nicely for me. Uh, Master Lamitis and Master Merrill were directing the things. It was, uh, if you recall, uh, we marched in or walked in from uh, the back of the auditorium up to the stage. I walked with my wife, uh, Rachel, and up onto the stage between the masters on either side, uh, following the protocol for, for former promotions like that, three individuals brought the the items of promotion up to the stage. Master, uh, I asked Master Weinberg to bring the plaque. And I was thinking of him because he was my co-author. We were co-authors for a book and we had worked together for many years in writing and editing. Uh, so he brought the uh, proclamation plaque. Master Ramitas read the plaque. Uh, Ma Master uh, Lucinda Oyen from my region uh, walked and she uh, presented the belt uh, to my wife, Rachel. And uh, Master Stein joined us on the stage. Uh, he he was our senior master there. His, he has a low Don number in the 1400s, 14,000. And a good friend of mine from long ago, he removed the belt and then uh, had asked Rachel to tie the belt on, just like we saw Mrs. Shin doing it to Grandmaster Shin when he was promoted. And then Master Fapuri, who was the vice president of the association, brought the ceremonial sword. It is a uh, uh, a special sword that Gideon managed to uh, acquire from Korea. It's a cutting sword. It's quite beautiful. And he brought that up. So I, I, I received the sword from him. And with the sword, I recited uh, my oath uh, to the association and to those assembled. So that it sort of follows the same pattern that we use for master's promotions as well with a few other things that, that I said at that time. So uh, that was the, that was the, the program. It, 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 it passed very smoothly. I was, I was nervous, of course, because this is an incredible honor to be uh, this, in this position 
And I, I know I had a lot of responsibilities and I was thinking of those responsibilities also during that time. Uh, but I know that I'm, a surround, I'm surrounded by very good people and with a, a large population that of, of Tongsudo members across the world in the thousands. Uh, so I, I try to relax and say, I'm gonna do the best job I can knowing that I've got lots of help in the process. So in accepting that, I made sure that personally I was I was aware of all uh, my responsibilities and that when I made the pledge, that's what I'm going to do. So and then I received an honorary bow for all of those those attending, and that was uh, that was the that was a nice ending to the entire ceremony. Uh, thank you for sharing your your recollections. I like you said, um, not not a lot of people got a chance to be there so to to hear your your side of it i uh i'm sure people will will enjoy uh kind of hearing it from the from the other side you mentioned master Vittori being the, the the vice president at the time who's now the what's his official title he's president now he's the president he's president of the association and uh recently announced two more uh vice presidents as well so we we do have two more uh, vice presidents actually you know those those positions like the presidency and the uh, we we'll call it operational vice president uh those those positions are announced and people apply for it as i did back early on and i guess i served as the president for four and a half four and a half years or a little bit more than that uh, and it was a four-year uh, renewable but uh, we decided in the fall, early fall, that we'd go ahead and split it up. We were going, it was supposed to be split anyhow, but with Grandmaster's death and the pandemic hitting us, they just asked me to assume that position for a while longer and we would, we would uh, advertise. So we did uh, and uh, advertised first for the presidency and several people applied for that and uh, inter interviewed for it and uh, Master, Master Fattori was recommended to the board of directors who voted. And then uh, uh, it was voted that he would take place on January 1st. And January 1st is kind of a, a unique date because Grandmaster Ken usually made appointment to the board or to the region on January 1st. And he didn't just do it during the year. And then with that happening, we uh, considered then advertising for his former position of, of operational vice president with a number of people who applied for that. And as uh, deliberations continued following the interviews, uh, the executive, executive committee, who, who is the first group to look at them before they're approved, uh, looked at all the candidates and uh, looked at their skills. And we decided, well, maybe we could use two uh, at the moment. Grandmaster Bodwin said way back then we should, we should have several. Uh, he didn't say how many, but we decided we'd do one back then to see how it operated, see how it worked out. But in this case, uh, it happens that these two individuals have a, a good skill set. And, and one, Master, Master Inosida, uh, Michael Inosida of Region 5 in the Chicago area, is fluent in Spanish. He's traveling that region frequently over many years, he's well known there. And we just thought, you know, we have a growing population in those areas uh, in region 18, which are the islands in Central America, Mexico, region 12, and South America, region 23. He's well known. And <clears throat> he has been there with, with me several times in these places, Mexico uh, and Argentina. And he's translated for me as we we attack some of the problems and issues, and he's very good at negotiations. So, in a sense, he is our liaison to the Spanish-speaking regions. Nicole Peterman, Master Peterman, then is the liaison for the USA regions, uh, and then Master Fatori and I decided that uh, it would be. Uh, probably a good idea if he and I together uh, sort of manage or be the first line for region 12 of Europe and of uh, Africa region 14. And it could be now that we have people in India, 
in that direction as well. So that's kind of how we divided it up. And uh, these two individuals hit the ground running and ready to do the job. And uh, we meet uh, periodically, weekly with them. And we meet with the executive committee every week and a GC every other week. So uh, I, this, this seems like it's gonna be very good for the association. Maybe in the future we'll have a, another like president, but right now, these are going just like we hoped they, they'd work out. So these two individuals, Master Nosa from Region 5, and then Master Peterman from Region 8. Excellent. Well, I, I know them both, and, and I have no doubt that they are doing and will continue to do a great job in their positions. Yeah. Um, talking about uh, appointments to positions, we talked about U.S. Nationals in 2022. After four years away, we got a chance to do the World Championships last year and had an unprecedented promotion for people to, to eighth degree black belt. Um, it, was, it was great to, to be in person again for the World Championships. So that was, a, that was exciting. But then to have that on top of that was just, it just put that uh, event through the roof. It was it was such a such a great event. It it was a grand event. <clears throat> uh, we didn't have we had a lot of people. Not not the number we had a, a few years before, but we were very successful. And people actually came from different parts of the world again. Uh, it was tough uh, getting visas, and then you know worrying a little bit about catching something on the plane. Uh, but one of the highlights, of course, was the selection and training over over about a year of four individuals in our association uh, for promotion to Bu Kwan Janim, assistant grandmaster. So we had master in in, a, in an order of their Don numbers, Master uh, Jerry Stein, Master Chuck Vaughn, Master Adam Sharp, and Master uh, Mujahid Khan were the ones who were promoted. Uh, Master Fattori and I discussed things with him over a period of a year. We talked a lot about uh, potential duties for them once they become assistant grandmasters. And of course, that would mean uh, uh, being my proxy, to use a to use a word, when I cannot go to some place. And actually, that's happened before some of them were promoted. But since then, they have been invited to some regions. Uh, I have advised them and directed them to go and help with especially promotions of masters. Uh, Grandmaster Finn said the, the grandmaster should be the one promoting those to master's level. As, as he said, and we put in the book, that he, he regarded the masters as his students. You know, they have their own teacher in the past, but they're his students. They're his trophies in the bookcase. Uh, so we have some very able-bodied people who are very knowledgeable of association and very skillful in what they do. So that was a, another ceremony we planned and, and laid out. And there's never been, you know, on that, on that specific stage, only one person being promoted at a time. And now we have four. Yeah. And so uh, we're very happy. That's that second place, and you know, like Grandmaster Finn, you know, in, in, at his graduation party to Ninth Dawn after after the that championship, it's kind of all just kind of said, uh, I look forward to having more Grandmasters, more assistant Grandmasters in the future. He he was the Grandmaster, so everyone else coming up would be assistant Grandmasters, and so that's the reason we had used the term Bukwanjanim. To, to, to distinguish that I mean, people will still just say grandmaster to some of them but most of the time everyone knows now we're starting to use that word uh book one them so we're very fortunate you know and uh, the future we're going to have more we have some seventh dons that have been in the, their position for a few years and contributing greatly to the association with the depth of knowledge uh and tong and the depth of knowledge in the history of the association so uh, more individuals are there, which means more of us are staying longer in the association, which is is good for retention. You know, we want to retain people, but having so many that are available is, is a good idea. 
Absolutely. Uh, and especially when you look at the, the four you mentioned, uh, Grimes, uh, Vaughn, Stein, you got I, opposite sides of the country. You have Mass, Grimes Sharp down in Texas and then over in region, uh, region 12, right? Is the is your region eleven in Europe? 11, sorry, uh, yes. region twelve is Mexico, right? <laughs> right, Mexico. Yes. Um, yeah. So you, you, I'm assuming strategically place to a certain degree, um, not not just their locations, but they're also long tenured and and very knowledgeable in, in Tung Sudo. And like you said, uh, they've they've been around for for many many years. And that's that's correct. They've been around many, many, many years. Um, Master Sharp, just as a, 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 an aside here, has, has been to every master's clinic, as I have. We're the only two that have been to every master's clinic. Uh, master Stein, as I said, has the lowest Don number of all in the 14,000. And he's been with the association. He was at the first master's clinic also. Uh, he had to miss one, I think, for hip surgery. Uh, but, but all four of them have been uh, have been in the association for a long time. Master Vaughn, of course, was a charter member uh, of the association. So they all have great history uh, with the association and, importantly, with Grandmaster Skin. So we each of us uh, worked with Grandmaster Skin uh, considerably. I came into the association a few years after uh, the charter convention. I was in Mutaquan. You know, we're still Tong Sudo, but uh, my instructor had not told us that this one had had formed in 1982. So we're we're blessed to have these individuals who Master Khan will be doing a lot of work with the European sector. And some some of us, of course, go there for the European Masters Clinic. Uh, and the other three have been working, will be working considerably in the USA. Master Sun is on his way to Mexico, I mean, to uh, Costa Rica uh, in July. So it'll be his first visit there and he'll probably be going back at some time in the future. Like how you said that, where you you mentioned that they all had a history with Grandmaster Shin. I remember uh, last year at the Masters Clinic, I, I, had, I had everyone raise their hands. Like I asked if, if anyone had, if there was anyone who had not met, met Grandmaster Shin and there was there weren't many, but there was a handful of people that were in that room that fortunately mm -hmm. never got a chance to train with him. And unfortunately, it's gonna that's gonna continue to grow. So the the more and more we can share our stories uh, about him, you know, we we keep that that fire and we keep that connection to him uh, for the association, and and we'll continue to grow through you know. I think it's important that we do what you're saying. Uh, you know, he died some, several years ago, and I think all of us probably mentioned him uh, when we're giving uh, presentations at clinics or world championship or some other place, acknowledging that he he had the vision uh, of the, of an association, and then it was his mission to do it. So for the next thirty odd years, he traveled. 30, 30 to 40 times a year to some place in the world. A few times he took people with him, like myself and, and a few others, uh, to different parts of the world to help with whatever was going on. But, you know, we, that's a history we need to keep repeating, and we will. Uh, so those of us who were, were with him a lot uh, are blessed to have been there, to learn from his wisdom, his passion for the arts, and uh, his instruction to us as well. I, I think about him. I've got his pictures all over the place. You see the, the yeah. picture there. I have computers on the other side, which they use with another big screen, and I have a different pic similar picture on that side of him. So, uh, yeah, he's on my mind, and uh, I will continue doing exactly uh, the concepts that he passed on to us. I think this is a, a perfect segue to talk about your your most recent book. It, it was published so uh, uh, a bit ago, but um, if you could share with us first the name of the book and how how that book came to be, and and maybe some some 
stories about uh, formulating it and writing it with Master Weinberg? Well, it, uh, uh, I was going to say, I'm going I'm to pick a copy of it here. Yeah, please do. So it starts. Well, I'm going to say something about the first book also, because this leads into the second book. Uh, it was uh, the year before Grandmaster Sam died. And, you know, he died uh, just a week or so, just a week, I believe, before the World Championship that year. And the year before, July, we were in Aruba together. Uh, Rachel, my wife, and his wife were there as well. And uh, we spent a lot of time together, walking around or doing things together. He had a great time. There's a picture in the first book of him holding a big mahi mahi, which as we walked by the fishing boat coming in, he was so enraptured with this fish, he just went over and grabbed it from this guy. Uh, and we talked with him for a while. But he was not feeling too good. He acted great. He enjoyed what, what was happening there. And it was not a few months later, he called and said he had cancer. And asked me if I would write his biography, which, which of course, I agreed to, knowing that I've never written anything like that before, a biography or anything or nothing of of, of, of what I would consider a book length uh, item, and I never got to see him face to face because as I said, look, I need to come and do interviews face to face. We'll do it over the phone. And I'm I'm busy right now. He said, "Don't worry, I'll be all right." But then, then the inevitable happened. The good thing coming out of this, the discovery by me and others who probably may have already known this, is that he wrote a lot. You know, he was an academic also, and we know he he worked on his books. Many of us helped with all six books uh, during those years he was writing, from early '90s until more recently. And so when we got to that point of getting to really get into the book, you know, what do you write about? How do you do something about a man? I, mean, I, looked, at, I looked at articles on the web about writing a biography and so forth, and nothing was really that instrumental to me. But I knew you had to do the research on it. Uh, and, but, you know, you don't, sometimes you look at a book, it's got the chapter headings and all this stuff, but that's not the way you start. You, uh, you start by looking at, a wide uh, range of possibilities. So I get back to the uh, the thought a moment ago about him writing. He wrote numerous bulletins starting in the early 60s. Uh, he wrote in articles that were put into the newsletters, of course, the six book, and, and other sort of pieces that he wrote. And some of these were like the bulletins came out every few weeks, it seems like. And the very fortunate thing is headquarters had it all digitized and it's in a server. And, and Gideon uh, gave me access to that. So you can imagine hundreds of these things that I could read. So one of the decisions, both the first and the second, was to read everything and excerpt some things out of it as I as I went through it. So I'm sitting here like I am with you, and uh, I've got one screen with all of that information that's been scanned, and I've got my documents over here, and I'm copying things out of here and saving it. Saving it, not knowing exactly where it might fit into the narrative, uh, but over a long period of time, I went through every one of those Many people contributed articles to me about him, magazines like uh, uh, Black Belt Magazine, Karate Illustrated, uh, Taekwondo Times. There's, there's a big one that was published in the UK. A lot of people interviewed him and they published a lot of his, uh, his comments. So that was really important. And, and then I also talked to others, some people who had written some of these articles in the UK or in this country as well for more background information. And then there were a lot of interviews with individuals within this country as well. But I began to see a, a friend along here. And I, if you work in a history, you tend to think of dates, you know? And I, what I didn't want to do was do something episodic. 
that on day one this happened, on day two this happened, this year happened, this happened, you know, just a string of dates. But I knew I had to have, I needed, I needed to know what that was like. So I had a very large piece of paper uh, and I, I wrote in things because I could put a date here, a date here, and then some information, a date here. So by months and months later, I had this big sheet that was all filled in with what I thought were significant events in his life, things that he said, just as a prompt, couldn't put everything. But I had a whole trend line here of things that he did, said, others said about him, just significant events in his life. So I had that tacked up. So that was that kind of gave me some guidance on the, the history part of it. My big decision to me was rather than writing something that was just the date, I wanted to write something that was more topical. So I wanted chapters that related to maybe his early life, maybe to the, uh, which I did, and, and you'll see it in in, in in this particular book. But there. They organize the chapters, uh, you know, like reflecting on a life well lived, brief, brief history of the eight tools ten. Uh, in Aruba, I wrote one happy island, a fish and unexpected ending. Uh, his early passion for martial arts from Osan to the U.S. was a little bit uh, a historical origin of the association. But then, then there was some chapters that were purely topical, like a, a focus uh, the Chinese connection. Uh, Qigong, training the master, the master clinic. Uh, and then uh, there's, there's some on his passion for building headquarters, which he, he moved in on May 9th, I believe, and he died July 9th. So he was there a short period of time, but he got to see it. And uh, his son, Robert, uh, gave me some texts that he wrote on a joy in his face and his voice and what he said when he saw the building for the first time. That was just great. Uh, so, you know, that fleshed out the book. It took several years to finish it. And uh, at some point in time, I said, well, I've got all this text. I got to put it together. Where do you stop? No one said how to end the book. But then again, I said, I've got, a, I've got this much. I'm going to stop. I'm going to polish everything else and have people who are helping edit it and read it give me the rest of it. I had a lot of good help, like Master Kelly Goodwin, Master Trom, Master Lipstein, and many others who contributed that way. Along the way, and there is in that book a little bit about uh, this, a chapter that's going to deal, that was uh, dealing with uh, uh, something m more philosophical, I guess you might say, but it was a focus on academics and the mind was the name of the chapter. And you know, you've written a thesis before and you're working on now another research project like this one. Uh, he wanted us to also have that, that type of uh, experience, you might say, related to Tang Sudo, but it's coming out of your mind. It's not just physical. Uh, so he was an academic, but he's also a martial artist. That was his passion. But he learned to read and write and research. He wanted us to do similar things. Maybe other associations do it, but I'm not a me met a master outside of us who did anything other than, and it, I shouldn't put it that way, who did only a physical test, but not more of what we what we have gone through to get there. And then after that was completed, and I must say that uh, you know even even. Uh, Master Wang Lee designed the covers for it. Uh, we, I started thinking about other things that I could not cover, but I have still have lots of text in my machine of things that I wrote. Uh, I have much more details about the development of the statue. Uh, I'm already telling the building, but you know, at some time you want to condense it when you're finishing that. So we could even have separate items on those. But it was with uh, on a trip to the Latin American Masters Clinic in Master Weinberg's first year to go to Argentina. And at that time, the, the clinic was in a town called Pergamino, which was about three hours by bus 
kind of north of the capital city of Buenos Aires. So I broached him with the idea because he had helped me quite a bit on editing the first book and especially some of the entrances into the books and the exits, entrance into the chapters and exit from the chapters as well, the lead-ins and the conclusion statement. Uh, he, you know, he's a professor at, the, at a university, and he's a good thinker and a good writer. So we worked together on those. But then I, I sat on the bus, you know, instead of just sitting there, I like to look at the landscape because I'm a geographer. But I just kind of casually asked him uh, about this idea of another book that focused more on his philosophy. And I'm just using a general statement without defining it. And so he and I talked for those probably pretty close to three hours on what could we possibly, what could possibly be in there? What would we draw upon? But we wanted to get into Grandmaster Ken's mind because you know all those things. He's published, you know, all the things in the book, uh, the Don Manual and the Gup Manual, you know, that, that comes from his head. Other people obviously contributed, as you well know, almost. We all contributed things in writing to his books, many of us, and in editing as well. But he was the one guiding all of this. And wh how did he get to that level? We knew he grew up in Korea, 1936, until he came here in 68. So he was influenced by, of course, Korean culture, uh, Korean philosophy, Neo-Confucianism, uh, and others, you know, like Buddhism had been an influence in that country, Confucianism itself, Neo-Confucianism, Christianity, uh, much, much later. And he was uh, influenced by all of that. His father was in education, so that was an influence on him as well. Uh, and he went... You know, when we were there the last time he took a trip to China and, and Korea, I was on that trip. He took us to his university uh, where we could see where he went to school. He pointed out, uh, I said, oh, on the second floor, I think, where he taught Tang Su Do there. And he eventually became the captain of the team. Uh, so we decided that we would work together, co-author this potential book. It it was not easy uh, to do that. The beginning of the book was going to be influenced by something that Master Weinberger had already written, a thesis he had written that would delve deeply and with a lot of pages into these early philosophies in East Asia. He's he's very well versed on, on in, in that part of the world. So I was thinking to myself, with that influence, we can probably figure out other things and that influence in some of his writings. Uh, and, and you've seen that, you've read some of those, I'm sure, as well, in the old Grandmaster Corners that came out for many, many years. Uh, but even those became sort of a focus of us, of our writings and our research on him. Eventually, we, we, we got together and decided on basic topics that we would approach, which uh, you see would be in this book, Grandmaster Finn and small, small letter. One more time, the philosophy, but the chapter headings are going to be familiar to all readers because they they deal with things like tradition, uh, the certificate, the belt, the uniform, a tradition of respect, professionalism, brotherhood, sisterhood. What do all these things mean? And then the body, mind, spirit, or mind, body, spirit. Uh, he wrote it using those words in different orders. Ethics. Um, Musha and that elusive topic that he never really explained to us, one with nature. Uh, <laughs> he left that up to us to explore on our own. So he never sat down with us and said, okay, this is move number one to get there. Uh, but he was uh, almost enigmatic, uh, most secretive. I wrote my seventh Don thesis on uh, uh, being becoming one with nature. And he sat down with me a long time to flesh out what some ideas that were in my mind. And he was, at first, he didn't know he was going to agree to me using that topic, but uh, he got excited about it and, and, and I took a stab at it. It's one of our, our journal publications. So, uh, Master Weinberg and I got together. Uh, we got together as frequently as he could. He would come down here, fly down, spend uh, Friday, Saturday, leave late Sunday, go back home, and we would work here. 
I have two computers set up here. And we would work in my office at the university, which had two computers up there. And so everything saved multiple locations. Uh, you know, I know people had only saved on one hard drive and lost their 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 documents, but we saved it, you know, on the computer hard drive, on flash drive, on external drive, on one drive. We saved it wherever we could. And each time we finished, you know, we, we would do this. And then he had copies, I had copies. But the process was, uh, we, we, we divided up the work, basically. Uh, and if you look at it this way, chapters that were became chapters. I worked on this part and wrote, uh, exhausted my, my knowledge of this subject matter. He would do it with that subject matter. We had trade them and we would read them. Each one of us would edit the others uh, in the rough editing stage, add to it, subtract from it. And as we went through it, we saw that there were other things we probably should approach also and add that to the, the basic working topic list. So um, we did that for quite some time. And he would, he would also come down to headquarters we would sit in the room upstairs, um, kind of the, the boardroom, and we had two very large screens, maybe 50-inch screens. And we put the, the text we're working on on one screen, and the, the one we're editing would go on the other screen. And I, I, did all the, I did all the typing work, all the editing work, and <laughs> it was interesting. He'd sit back and think and think, and he would, it's like his mind would come out with six or seven new, new sentences. We put it in there. And we see how it flowed, and then we would rework it or something along those lines. But both of us were doing this back and forth. Uh, uh, Ellen Payne came down once, and she worked with a lot of the graphics. Uh, she would bring things to us upstairs. She'd go back downstairs with another computer. She would find things, get photographs. So she was running back and forth. Other people, of course, contributed to the editing of it. Uh, and uh, We've worked on this a couple of years um, because we have other things to do as well. Right. But I can see uh, that um, it was we had we had fun doing it. We got exhausted sometimes, exasperating sometimes. Uh, do we need to leave this out? Is there too much of this? Uh, are we writing at too much of an academic level? We bring it down to a general level of the reading public. And I think we we did that. There, there are all sorts of questions you ask yourself along the way, because he and I are both accustomed to writing at the academic level. But we need to make it where it's a, a good flow to it, easy to read and meaningful. There may there are probably other ways it could have been done, but we felt like we were we were giving it uh, maybe a first run. Maybe someone else can take one of these ideas and run with it, or there may be something in the future that could come all right. In fact, some, of, some people have asked, when are you gonna do another one? But <laughs> I, got a rest after, I got a rest after that one, but working with Matthew Weinberg was really a joy. Um, uh, and I, we worked very, very well together. So we got to the point where we thought, well, this, this, could, be, this could be it. And I worked on getting the graphics and everything ready for it. Uh, he worked on the bibliographic section. We we just shared things. Uh, the strengths each of us had to do the parts that we did, and I think when you read it, if you or you read it, that it flows like in one voice. You know, we we both wrote, and we're I guess we got accustomed to each other's writing, and eventually we were pretty close to the same voice. But we made sure in the last draft that as we flowed through it, it was it, it could have been uh, perceived or understood as if one voice is carrying it all the way through. It was it was fun, it was enlightening, uh, and it was a lot of work. Uh, so I hope that uh, our reading public will see it and you'll know more about what goes on and uh, what went on in Grandmaster Shen's mind all those years. And if people want to get the book, can they get through the association? Yeah, the so association has the books. Uh, Mass Weinberg and I have pre-signed some of them already. Okay. Uh, if anybody wants to just call or write the association, uh, there'll probably be uh, books like these at the uh, the nationals coming up here in July in Chicago. 
I believe at region region eight, they typically have them there for for sale. And most likely, like usual, we've had them at the World Championships in 24. It's great. I uh, I know talking to Master Weinberg that he said a lot of the same things that you said. He just had a, it was a joy to to work with you, and um, I'm I'm sure you can feel that through through reading the the book. Um, I've yet to be able to get to headquarters and and peruse that. Uh, exhaustive amount of uh information there i'm i'm sure like you said i'm sure there's another book in there somewhere or it might be fun to to do a a video of going through stuff and and sharing sharing yeah. some of that uh on a video it, it, it could very good idea explore that and write your things down that's kind of the way i think he did it for this book and i did it for both books so just just Almost anywhere I was, sometimes an idea would pop in my mind and often I'd write it down or I'd remember it, come back and write it down. So I had a book of ideas of things out there. Uh, it is uh, it is a, a process where you have things scattered all around the place. I had things pasted up on the wall here. We've got a big wall of all these things up here. You know, Have I done that part of it? Have I done that part of it? And I'd check it off and... Uh, see how long it was, see how short it was. Uh, it's just games you play with yourself as you're doing this. And so I was not was not a book writer, but I've learned more about it. But there was one book I read called Writing Down the Bones that I found in a, in a, a bookstore in Nashville, probably six or eight months after I started writing. You get a little bit of writer's cramp every once in a while, I, but the book was just very short. Uh, very short uh, 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 chapters, I guess I might say, four or five pages maybe. <laughs> but this one is through many editions, and I and I thumbed through it quickly. There were other books on writing, and, and there was one called I don't remember the exact title, "Writing Like a Samurai." So I said, "Oh, I got to read this book." <laughs> and it, so I did, and it was it changed my life uh, in writing because it just relaxed me, and the way she wrote it. Uh, and she's influenced a lot of writers. So I have I have given this title to other people who are having problems and they've read it, problems of getting through writing or just starting their thesis. And it's, it's helped to inform them or make people relax. So uh, that's that was one of the things that, that got me going full speed finally when I read that. Found well, direction and got it. Yeah. Well, you're... Your books are inspirational. I, I know I took inspiration in doing this project of doing the many interviews from from you, since you're obviously a, a lover of, of of history and being able to write down, you know, Grandmaster Shin's history, and obviously being, you know, in geography, obviously has a lot of history in the, of the world. Yes. yes. Um, so I, I appreciate your your inspiration and your support um, in, in my own project because it, it means a lot to me. And much like you said with Master Weinberg, you had support and, and many others. Um, I, I appreciate your support as, as well um, in, in, in doing this endeavor. Well, thank you for saying that. Uh, your, your project sort of parallels what, what this these, these two books were about, and, and you know that, I've told you that before, uh, but that idea that you came up with interviewing, uh, I've seen it in my own profession as a, a one geographer interviewed the old timers at that time, they were old timers, you know, they were people who wrote the major books in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, and some of them were getting pretty old and I taught the history and philosophy of geography course at the university but to have those videos of those those giants in the field in front of my students because they were reading the work but now they got to see the individual so what you're doing is you're you're getting uh, now somewhat like archival history but you're getting live uh, the, the uh, information from the masters and our our, our individuals who want to know more about some somebody or something or writing more about masters 
will eventually have access. So at some time in the future, you know, I know that you're continuing this project and at some time uh, we'll work how we get that archive so it can be available uh, in, a, in a digital library perhaps. We're a long way from that right now, but it's it's certainly in our minds as a future. Well, I know it's a lot of work for you. I know it's a lot of work for you if it was work for me, but uh, you know, if there's something about being in Tonsado that it doesn't feel like work. It just feels like uh, we want to contribute what we know and how we do it. It's worth it. I one one of the ways I I think of it, you know, we've we've seen each other throughout the years, and always give a hug, talk for a few minutes, but there's never an opportunity where you or I or any of the people that I've talked to get a chance to sit down for an hour and, and talk about, you know, whatever it is, the his, their history, stories about Grandmaster Shin, about their dojangs. You're not going to be able to do that at Masters Clinic or at World Championships. Yeah. So I, yeah. I, I cherish these opportunities to be able to do this personally and then to get to share it with, with, with everyone else. So um, this is actually, I, I looked it up. It was, this is episode 81. This is the 81st one I've done. 81. So well, um, you know, you look at that as a big number, but then you, you think about how many masters and, you know, uh, code on jaw there are, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's dropping the bucket. So well, you're you're 81, and we have uh, you know well over 300 masters. Uh, we had 277 at the latest masters clinic, but about 30 or 40 of them were the candidates. Mm -hmm. uh, and you you do have a way to go. And <laughs> you, you, maybe at some time you sometime in your future, you know, you'll get someone else to help you along the way. But right now, um, I'm giving you a lifetime job <laughs> <laughs> of uh, carrying this project as far as you can. Uh, and uh, but knowing you should know and feel very proud of the idea of what you're doing and uh, the the obvious contribution to the history of the association. So capturing these individuals and the things that they know and the questions that were asked puts a, a real personal touch uh, on the masters in the association. So oh, from the bottom of my heart, association, thank you for what you're doing. It's my pleasure, sir. Thank you for, uh, like I said, thank you for the support. Um, we're we're right around an hour, so I want to be, uh, I want to start to wrap up. Is there anything that we we haven't touched on today? Obviously, we could continue to talk <laughs> for hours, but um, we'll we'll put a bow on it for today. Is is there anything you would like to to finish or with or or share before we we wrap up? Well, uh, there's, uh, I won't continue much longer, but uh, I think we, uh, by doing what you're doing and what we have done, Master Weinberg, myself, and anybody else has written some things, is that we've laid a, gr a good groundwork for our association. Uh, and it's, it's incumbent for everyone else to get a book, borrow it from somebody else, read about us, uh, know what we're like, how we think, uh, and this will keep people involved and interested. One of the things that, you know, that I pledge to do to myself and to everyone else is to nurture this organization to the best of my ability for as long as I can. And I don't plan to slow down at any time in the future, but having the background, uh, the depth of knowledge that you're providing that comes out of this book and other publications that we have, will go a long way of informing our population of how we started, what we're all about, why it started, and how it can affect your lives and others very positively. So this is what I leave you with. This is a, these are good things. This is a great association. And to come from a man, a, a single person who had this grand concept to bring us all together uh, in this association, I mean, it, it's quite extraordinary. Uh, I don't know another one quite like that, where we all work together. You said that we came together during pandemic times, and we are indeed a big family in the world, Tang Sudo. I think that's a perfect ending, sir. Again, thank you for your time, and uh, you're welcome. I, I look forward to seeing you soon, sir. Tang Su. I do too. Heal well, my friend. Tang yes, Su.